everybody. Good morning. It is a beautiful morning. Pretty good visibility. Cloudy, 40 degrees. Winds east northeast at seven. Hi, I'm Earl Finkler. It's seven a.m. Avu at home sleeping, as is noon, I imagine. Today's Friday, August thirty. It's been the one constant in my life now since 1975. So, uh, even though lots of other things have changed uh, in the background, I've been out here looking at Guillemots uh, since 1975. Tonight, mostly cloudy with areas of fog, low temperature 30, 35, and east winds 10 to 20. Guillemots, because they live deep in, in the pack ice and in, in the cracks in the ice, are about the only Arctic seabird that really lives next to the ice, likes the ice, and, and is tied to the ice as much as we associate penguins being tied with ice. It was not by accident that, that my work up in, up in Alaska started in 1970 and I found the colony in 72 at a time when there was more of a view saying how can I do something that, that like I find to be meaningful that I think is also meaningful in, um, in a much larger context as opposed to how can I do something that will maximize my retirement benefits uh, in 25, 30 years. It's strange in lots of ways. I mean, it's strange to do a 30-year study. It's stranger still to have picked a spot like this. There's an image that shows where the temperature has warmed the most globally in the past 25 years. And this area has had the greatest rate of increase from 75 when I started the study up to 2002. Uh, if you look at the rate of uh, temperature increase, this happens to be the spot. It is at the edge of uh, a boundary between the Arctic and the subarctic, so that you get both species from uh, the Arctic and the subarctic here. And since those, both of those groups are responding to climate change, you can see the Arctic species having to deal with a warmer environment and the uh, subarctic species having the opportunities of moving into an area that they didn't occupy in the recent past. I talk to school groups to talk about how people used to, like Thoreau and Emerson and others, would look at nature as something that was stable, whereas human society was all in chaos. But you went to nature and the birds showed up at the same time. Now you have a situation where nature is showing as much instability almost as uh, human systems, that you go out every year and what you see is change and sometimes unpredictable change. It makes you realize that, wait a minute, maybe uh, there's much more chaos in the world in all systems than we, than we realize. At first it was exciting because it was really, because it is fun to see something new. It's, it's kind of like, it, it was kind of exciting in the way that a snow day is exciting when there's a break in the pattern. You know, you go, oh, this isn't something I thought was going to happen, but now this year the, the ice is going to pull offshore. Then when you see it happening year after year and you see the birds doing badly through time and you see chicks starving, it becomes uh, not that exciting but kind of depressing when you then put it in the whole context of what's happening globally with, with temperature changes and with the ultimate disappearance apparently of the Arctic pack ice. Um, it's very unsettling to be honest. I've had a number of situations where I'm looking at the images of how they think the pack ice is going to retreat over the next 40 years, and it still sends chills up my spine because I think this is something that is going to change a great deal on Earth and much more than certainly than this one population of, uh, of birds. It makes me feel that, that, that there is something going on that is so big that this is just a minor part of it and that it's going to continue and ultimately uh, future generations are going to have to deal with it in some way. One, uh, 34, 240. This guy's going to go tonight. He's 144. He's waiting. Well, uh, we're trying to get as sensitive a monitor as we can to prey availability, and once a day, uh, a once a day wait allows us to look at, at, at daily variation in prey abundance. One of the birds out here has one of the few Arctic cod we've seen in the past few days. 
We are now in a situation where the pack ice retreat is uh, so early and so extensive, uh, and this certainly happened this year in 2007, that the guillemots have to turn to a completely subarctic uh, food source. But the guillemots' favorite prey species is arctic cod, and uh, having uh, having to turn to sculpin has uh, made it hard for some of these parents to feed their young. This food situation, yeah, it's really getting kind of bleak, and um, for those chicks that are too young to even think about leaving the nest, it's really uh, upsetting to see them at less than 200 grams and a wing of less than 115 or so, and they are totally dependent on what food is brought in that nest site entrance, and if nothing is coming in, um, they just have to basically sit there and wait it out. While the ice is melting offshore and the birds are suffering as a result, the island that they've been using um, happens to have had a permafrost core, which is also melting, and as a result, the island is eroding more rapidly. So, so the same warming that's taking their food away during the breeding season is also reducing the stability of the island that they're that they're breeding on. We're also in a situation where the retreat of the pack ice has allowed horned puffins to move up and breed on a regular basis, on an annual basis, and breed successfully in an area where they did not in the past, and they are competing with guillemots for nest sites. It's a horned puffin chick, about a, maybe two weeks old now, looking at 30 more days in the, in the nest. You can tell he's, he's nowhere close to getting ready to fly. The first time I ever saw a polar bear on the island, it was right behind this, this very large nest box here. And uh, I was walking up to it and luckily started singing or whistling and the bear raised its head above the nest box. And I turned around and ran as fast as I could back to the camp, which isn't something you're, sp you're supposed to do. But he's clearly just, he's going down the beach line looking for uh, anything he can eat, which is, I mean, it's kind of, it's depressing because there's nothing out here. As polar bears are pushed off the ice and onto the beach, you then have uh, a large predator walking around that will feed on, on, on the nestlings. So that so the polar bears on the beach are connected to the fact that the ice is retreating more and is also less hospitable for them in a number of ways. And they are suddenly here so that they are then feeding on these on these guillemot chicks. So, so the, uh, the guillemots and their chicks are vulnerable to a wide range of, of issues that have to do with melting ice and far more than I ever realized, of course, when I, when I started here and just thought that these were pack ice animals that were uh, going to be living here for a long time because the pack ice would be here for a long time. And now, by the end of the century, it could be gone. If I was in Seattle in, in June, July, August, it would just drive me nuts to, to know, to be thinking, gee, what's going on with these, with the colony and with specific birds and with specific nest sites. I come back because I'm so curious as to how they're dealing with all that because it's such a time of, of massive change for the colony. Another year down. Another year down. Only 33 more to go. <laughs> <laughs>